Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Policy Lab webinar series. Policy Lab is a research center within Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Research Institute. Our care for children and families drives our research, informing practice and policy to improve child health. This webinar series is just one of the many tools we use to translate the work under our four research portfolios into evidence-based policy solutions at the local, state, and federal levels. Today we'll be highlighting work from our intergenerational family services and healthcare coverage, access, and quality portfolios while exploring a question we know is on the mind of many. How do we address social determinants of health to improve the health and well-being of kids and families? Dr. David Rubin and Lee Wilson are going to walk you through the current landscape for tackling these issues in pediatrics, ways to build a business case to implement intergenerational social risk programs with leadership in your own organization, and practical examples of these strategies at work. Dr. Rubin and Lee both have firsthand experience and knowledge of how social determinants impact children in our communities. Dr. Rubin is the Director of Policy Lab and of Population Health Innovation here at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and is a pediatrician with more than 20 years of experience. Lee Wilson is an Improvement Advisor for the Population Health Innovation Team and the Division of Social Work at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as a trained social worker. Before I hand it over to them to get us started, let's go over a few logistical notes. We've collected questions from several of you who submitted them prior to the webinar via email. You can also submit questions during the presentation by using the chat function, which can be found on your webinar control panel. We hope to address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. All lines will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. We'll post a recording of this webinar to our website tomorrow, and you can access it and other resources by visiting policylab.chops.edu. We encourage you to share via Twitter as well, tagging us at policylabchops. With that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Rubin and Lee to get us started. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, we've got a pretty, I think, both informative and kind of a fun presentation we have here for, for those folks who are investing a lot of time and energy thinking about this work. Um, this is going to play out just the ground rules to get started. Um, this is going to play out as more of a conversation between Lee and myself. Um, Lee, you ready for that? I'm ready. All right. And uh, I think a little bit irreverent, um, a little bit sort of thought-provoking, um, and assume some basic knowledge, I think, of sort of the space around social determinants and much more about how do we move uh, the ball down the field um, and how do we start to really get sustainable uh, programs that actually achieve some of the I think aspirations of folks who are working in this field. So, are you ready to get started there, Lee? Let's get started. I'm excited. All right. So, um, you know, as a practicing pediatrician for over 20 years, as, as Laura has said, you know, I've seen many patients, and most of us who work with children will see many patients um, during our time where, where the elephant on the table for many of us are a lot of social problems that folks have. And whether you're working in emergency, inpatient, or ambulatory settings, it's a uh, very, very common, and usually when they happen, if I'm being totally honest with you guys, um, it's in the context of a busy office environment or a busy emergency department, and I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, um, can I get my social worker to help out and, and wave their magic wand because I don't have time for this, but I know it's important. So then I try to call Lee, and what, what are you thinking, Lee, when you get that call from me? Well, as a social worker, and, and I'm sure for those of you on the Call who are social workers or case managers or community health workers. Um, addressing social needs is really a core part of our practice and training. But from the perspective of a healthcare system, just because of the way our system is structured and because it's structured to provide really world class, medically focused services, our work is often reactive and crisis driven when it comes to social determinants of health. Um, so, Dave, the cases that you're probably seeing in primary care or the example of the emergency department that you're giving are probably the cases that have reached the crisis phase or um, are more urgent cases, and those are much harder for Dave or myself or the whole clinical team to address, and it probably means that we missed an opportunity sooner um, to intervene. So those are some of the things that we want to talk more about today. So many people are familiar with this slide. When I was actually starting to develop our program here, this was probably sort of what I thought was the money slide. 
to show our uh, leadership, right? And I think many folks would show this slide, which is uh, the ice, the typical iceberg slide, where above the waterline you have all those healthcare factors that we address every day in our clinical care, but below the waterline is the much larger um, share of cycles, social risk factors that really do impact a child's health that are probably driving their healthcare use and, and their overall health more than the actual clinical conditions themselves. And so, you know, you show this slide at a board meeting and and I want to I, I want you to imagine that you're an executive in the room and, and you're saying, well, how do they respond to this? Um, and in general, you get those sort of Maggie Simpson kind of blinking eyes because I think there's a question of like, what are the boundaries of this? Like how much should how much are we really responsible in the context of all the priorities we have around our clinical responsibilities to be addressing the stuff below the waterline. And so you often get stopped dead in your tracks thinking, well, where are we going? And so the conversation just kind of becomes this sort of circular argument that you feel like you've been having for years, right? And that's the nature um, of, I think, the challenge. And how do you get past that? And Dave, I think the flip side of that is that from a social worker community perspective, I think sometimes this topic can be frustrating because social determinants of health is not a new concept. Um, and sometimes I think we talk about it like it is, but um, it's such a core part of our discipline and um, services that have been provided for you know decades and decades. But within healthcare, it's still a growing conversation about how we broaden our definition of what contributes to health. Um, and there's been growing recognition among professional and national organizations about the importance of how do we proactively address social needs in the context of healthcare, and for pediatrics, how do we do that in a way that can mitigate risk for children's health outcomes and development. Um, and these recommendations from these professional organizations have been really helpful in providing a foundation and an incentive for healthcare systems as a whole to be thinking differently about this issue. I'm guessing for those of you on the phone, you're very familiar with these organizations, um, but if you have questions, we're happy to address them in the question and answer period. And I know there's a, you know, because we've been sort of having the conversation and now we have a lot of upstream pressure to start doing this work, and many Medicaid programs, including our own here in Pennsylvania, are starting to require us um, to incorporate this into practice. There's a little bit of a scary moment where you're like, how are we going to do this without completely burning out our provider workforce? Um, are mm -hmm. we really prepared to do this? And related to that, I think, you know, what is the current state of screening and referral? Um, and I'm guessing for those of you from healthcare systems on the phone, this probably looks familiar that we have a lot of people who are working and doing really great work around implementing screening and referral within a healthcare context. Um, and I, we call have these, uh, I call the, these people our do-gooder colleagues who are in their own little in the world trying to make a difference. Absolutely, and I think they are making a difference for the patient populations they work with. Um, but because many of these projects are in or leaving pilot phase, what the result is is that we have fragmentation in the work. So even within our network, we have different screening practice, we have different questions, different administration of the questions happening, which from a family's perspective could mean that they're being asked different questions depending on where they come in for their services. And also from a community agency perspective can mean that the same community agencies are getting approached by people within the same organization or within the same network to perform to form separate partnerships. So what we're looking to do is not only implement this work in an effective way, but also standardize it within our own organization. So this is the sort of like well-meaning folks really who in some ways we end up setting up these silos because it's the nature of sort of the you know, everyone's sort of out for them trying to advocate for their their programs and doing the right thing, but you get this system that um, doesn't seem to have some uh, some level of organization to it. Um, so, all right, well, let's talk about what, what some of the barriers have been. Um, you know, from the physician's time, I think when you think about sort of things that are thrown out there, whether universal screening or, or you know, um, or a lot more attention in the clinical setting, I think it terrifies my colleagues, Lee, honestly, if I'm being truthful. I mean, where am I going to fit that in? Um, I'm not sure I have the training to do that. Certainly have no idea where to send most of these folks if they screen positive. So I really, the idea of a bridge to nowhere is really 
not a concept I'd like to endorse because it makes me feel completely ineffective and it feels like it's uh, it's an overreach. And then you, f- you have a fear sometimes, I think, if you're being honest, of offending patients. You know, they came here for their clinical care and I'm sort of hitting them with this kind of impersonal survey. Um, and I'm not sure everyone wants to kind of talk about that. And uh, And so... I'm not sure how much that is real or not, but um, it, these are the things that go through the mind of my colleagues. And then, so, you know, at the hospital, you know, again, the, the lack of the, the sort of best practice, um, I'm, you know, often your community partnerships, sometimes they're organized to some degree, but how well have we created what I what we're going to talk about later, which are these resource maps, which have centralized uh, the function of identifying and, and cultivating our community aging, agency partnerships. Often those aren't well developed, um, and then the almighty dollar, which is how are we going to build the workforce? What is the you know how are we going to train our finance teams uh, to create the mechanisms by which we can bill for in many ways, which are dyadic services or parental services that are intended for the parent and the family on the uh, for the benefit of the child. And when it comes to community agencies. Um, you know, healthcare systems and community organizations have very different payment and funding structures, I think, which can make it really difficult for community agencies to build new services like referral pipelines um, or the data integration that could really help improve this work from a system perspective. Um, so things like technical assistance and capacity building within community agencies is something we really need to think about even as we build new services within our healthcare system. So let's pivot now and talk about where are we going to, but where are we trying to go? So if we create a sort of vision in terms of what our teams, uh, you know, at the micro versus macro level are trying to do, what are we trying to accomplish here uh, from a larger population health perspective within these health systems? And so um, we're going to pivot to that discussion now. So, you know, I want to credit uh, my mentorship. I mean, Angela, Dr. Angelo Giardino, who's now the department chair at, at Utah, um, uh, and just joined them a, a few months back. Um, he was an early uh, mentor to me in thinking about the, what I call the secret sauce uh, for population health. And I don't think this is rocket science, but I think, you know, to me, what we're trying to achieve is to be better about selecting the right population on the left um, and then creating the right integrated team that to my colleagues who were concerned about provider burnout and physician sort of lack of training, this is not intended to be necessarily a physician response. Uh, we're building teams of clinicians and, and coordinators and social workers and uh, navigators or community health workers, and we're trying to make the outcomes, um, make them re- thinking about globally what everyone's responsibility on a distributed team is to ensuring uh, a certain patient experience and outcome. And then if we can figure out what they want their workflow to be and what their individual responsibilities, we can align them with the right technology and tools so that they're ultimately providing care that's coordinated for the right people at the right time in the right place and is very uh, family-centered. So how do we get there? that doesn't happen overnight, but I can tell you, you know, having navigated and watching some of my colleagues nav- navigate this beyond my own environment, um, when you're speaking to your executive team, in some ways you need to understand what motivates them in terms of, of their stewardship of the organization so that you get visibility. Clearly, the iceberg slide was not the way to get their attention. Um, and so what I have found over time is there are three uh, enterprise-related outcomes that I think a lot of executives think about. They, they, they share an interest in reducing fragmentation of services, um, particularly in the children's hospital space, but in a lot of children's health systems with the centralization of a lot of sick kids and often medic, uh, children in Medicaid uh, washing up on the shores of these health systems who are also responsible for tertiary care. Um, capacity issues and optimizing capacity management, keeping kids out of the hospital is important um, so that there's enough throughput for all the kids that need to use our, our services. And then finally is that, you know, most executives want to ensure that we're providing financial stewardship and value uh, to the organization. And so we're going to look at different business cases from here on through the lens of these outcomes and how you build a business case. The case we're going to use for this is, is a case that's fairly common. I could change the clinical condition, but let's just say a mother, Mia, brings her eight-year-old son, Tony, to the emergency department because Tony's having an asthma flare. Um, 
Uh, I go down to see Tony. He's been in the emergency room three times in the last three months, so he's a frequent flyer. Um, you know, we can tell his mom's clothes are, she's an obvious smoker. Um, she's an extremely flat affect, so I wonder about depression. And so I'm like, and I've got three rooms waiting to see me and people standing out in the hall. So I call my friend Lee. Yeah, and if I put myself into the headspace of um, my colleagues in the emergency room, I know that like most people in the room, they, including Dave in this scenario, they are juggling a million things at once. So as a social worker, I would most likely go into the room and my main priority is doing a safety assessment to determine any urgent needs um, when it comes to Tony. So if I determine that he is um, safe, then most likely I'm going to send me a home with a list of phone numbers and services um, that she can access for some of the needs that we get to talk about, whatever that may be that we get to address in the five or ten minutes that I have with them. So that's what happens. Um, I think that's the standard of care uh, in most places these days. Um, how does that relate to our business case? Well, the status quo we're in this fragmented world and we're just living it every day, right, Lee? Um, and uh, I don't think we're doing much to optimize capacity and manage. I think there is that sort of needle in the stomach, you know, that sort of like agitation that you just got through your, your shift or your day, but have you really helped these families or, you know, created some level of a game change for them? And I, you know, and I don't think we're optimizing capacity, and we're certainly not improving our financial stewardship and value. But we do need to recognize, uh, next slide, that there are benefits to the hospital and trade-offs as we appraise these. This the case of do nothing different. Um, there is no upfront cost, and I think there is an assumption that, um, you know, based on our, uh, um, I believe our responsibilities and our interest in trying to do the most for our families that there's no upfront cost, there's no change to current workflow, and people will just figure out, I suppose, how to how to do the best they can in resource-poor environments. But there are trade-offs. Um, we're burning out our providers, uh, you know, assuming that the physician uh, and maybe a social worker, if they're available in, in that department, are going to be able to put out these fires. Uh, the children and families are not served well. There's an increasing risk and cost for Medicaid enrolled patients, particularly at a time when we're talking about block granting Medicaid, um, and uh, and we're really not moving the needle there. And then there's a lot of fragmentation that that also kind of irritates different people in terms of turf and and an inefficient and a costly workflow to your social work division, Riley. Yeah. So let's talk about a uh, another way. There's been so much focus on standardized social risk screening. So what if we just implemented screening, Dave? Well, yeah, this is what I think I'm seeing most of out there is a lot of people doing great work coming up with some standardized screening. Let's get everyone in the room. This is the plan that says, okay, let's get all those do-gooder colleagues together and the folks from social work and, and interested parties and form a work group and then actually uh, develop a let's all agree on the 10, 11 items that we're all going to screen for that can help with some resource planning but can also assume that we can standardize our IS screening of folks, and so if we can upfront that to our providers, more people will get served, right? So Mia takes the, you know, in this situation, Mia would take an electronic screener. Maybe she's got a tablet that's presented her at the door. She screens positively for her own behavioral health issues, some smoking issues, some housing insecurity, and then I do the same thing I did before, which is I ask Lee, come wave your magic wand, and you like this solution, Lee? I mean, in the absence of a magic wand, you know, there are some positives to it that we might have identified needs that might have not come out um, previously. Maybe Mia wasn't comfortable raising them. Maybe we didn't have time to talk to her about them or ask her those questions. Maybe she felt more comfortable disclosing that information on a tablet than she would in a conversation with you or I. Um, but as you pointed out, Dave, the result for Mia is the same in this case, that she sent home with phone numbers for community services. So. Um, it's great that we identify need, but that does increase the volume of needs that we are then responding to with that five to ten minutes that we had previously without giving us really any back-end tool to help us respond effectively and meaningfully to the needs that are being raised. So, you know, I think, you know, we all can argue that this definitely reduces fragmentation of 
services. I think it also can help with resource planning. I think once you can document need, maybe it can help with your executive team just to see what people are seeing out there, although we have a lot of historical data that you can do that with as well, but somehow it feels more real when you can show them on your own group. Um, while we reduce fragmentation of services, I'm not sure we're optimizing capacity management. In, in fact, I probably just increased the amount of volume coming to Lee's phone, and so I'm not surprised when I get that sort of like two rings on the iPhone, and then you get this little text back, sorry, I can't talk right now, All right? So you get used to that message because she's completely inundated with the number of requests that are coming in, right, Lee? Absolutely. And so I'm not sure like we figured out a system to what I call the e-ferrant end of actually helping families, but we certainly are screening them more systematically. And then uh, I'm not sure we've done anything to improve financial stewardship or value. And so we can now appraise the benefits and the trade-offs um, of this approach. I do think there's some upfront cost, but it's mostly in the, you know, it, it convincing your IS team to do some screening or some data, and there's some tablet costs. You can often use grant funding to get some of these things started. Um, there's certainly that reduction in fragmentation. Uh, I think a, a little bit more transparency in those resource uh, discussions uh, when budget time comes up, but there are trade-offs. Um, there's a continued risk, uh, you know, uh, uh, partial fragmentation for how patient social needs are uh, both triaged and addressed. And what I mean by this is you can triage them, but if you're not addressing them, you're fragmenting. You, you're, you're really, you know, there's, no, there's no full process that's been born out there. The providers, if they're inundated with uh, lots of folks with these social risks, they're going to feel compelled to somehow figure it out, and they're going to be getting home later from work because they're they're getting caught 15, 20 minutes behind their schedule because they're constantly having to run around and figure out what to do. Um, there's not, you know, we may have increased capacity management needs um, if we're not responding with a disciplined plan. And there's, uh, and I think we have to worry that the lack of response to positive, screen, uh, positive screens can actually sour our patients on why we're asking these questions in the first place. You know, I think it is interesting, Dave, that um, like we mentioned, and as I'm sure you all have experienced on the phone, there's a, a big focus on social risk screening right now. And Dave mentioned the state Medicaid um, requirements that are coming down the pipeline to screen within primary care. Um, and I think that there's just not as much focus on that, um, the back end piece, and what are we going to do to respond when we get that positive screen. And I think also when we talk about costs, often we think um, you know, first about the monetary costs of intervention, but I think patient experience is a really big factor and, um, you know, asking families to disclose information when we come in um, is something that um, we just need to be responsible with. So this is where the meat of the talk is. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about a, new, a different strategy that we're trying to deploy here, which is uh, what we call a tiered service delivery strategy. Uh, and it's particularly effective when your resources are scarce. You can't do a one-size-fits-all model uh, for everyone. And so I'm going to let Lee go ahead and talk about it because uh, this is her baby. So this is probably not an unfamiliar model because... Um, you know, it's a very familiar to allocate resources based on the level of risk, but what it's starting to do is to incorporate not just medical risk into how we identify need among our patients, but also social risk and putting social risk into that formula. So what we want to do is ensure that services are matched appropriately to patients' medical and social needs, um, and we want to maximize the value of the investment we're making in social risk services. So a tiered service delivery model, it creates an economy of scale. So it provides, um, you know, at the base, access to standardized screening and referral um, to all children as a means of identifying um, risk and need among patients. And then from there, for patients who are have low medical and social complexity, um, provides brief or less costly um, interventions to um, so the middle tier, and then to the top tier, who are our highest risk patients, um, it's allocating uh, more intensive resources, more intensive as in more resource intensive and time intensive resources, such as interdisciplinary service coordination. So it's really ensuring that the resources are maximized by 
allocating them to the patients who need them the most. I also think you also, as you move to those top tiers, that's where your community health workers are doing more visits out to the home. There's really more of an extension out to the home and not just in our offices. And uh, and those are much more resource, it can be more resource intense. Absolutely. And it's recognizing that there's a continuum of social needs. You know, I think a lot of times this work can be really overwhelming because there is such a large proportion of our patients who are facing poverty-related needs that this gives a um, framework for ensuring that we are really targeting the highest need patients. So let's talk about the, you know, from a vision perspective, how does this work? Well, it definitely reduces uh, fragmentation of services. And if we do a good job in terms of optimizing the, the, the services we're providing to those different tiers, and we believe that those services are going to manage risk away from the hospital, then potentially we're going to affect hospitalization rates, uh, uh, particularly around ambulatory sensitive conditions or ED rates, et cetera. Um, and so those for those quality improvement folks out there, we can talk about how you marry this um, as part, you know, that the driver here is that we're doing a much, much better assessment of risk and tailoring services to the right families will lead to a reduction in the uh, use of the emergency department for uh, uh, ambulatory sensitive conditions or to reduce length of stay among families um, uh, or reduce rehospitalizations among families with lots of social risk. Um, and then finally, if, you know, if we do that, we are also going to improve st uh, stewardship and value. Many of the families or most of the families who are going to be impacted here are probably children in the Medicaid program. And as you know, and those 10, uh, those um, insurance plans don't tend to reimburse as well as those uh, commercial plans that are responsible for a lot of your tertiary care and the folks coming from outlying areas. And if we, in some ways, from a cost avoidance perspective, if we're actually getting more children in Medicaid out of the hospital from the neighborhoods around the hospital and we're making room for that uh, child coming in for complex cardiac repairs, et cetera, uh, we're probably improving the overall financial stewardship and value to the organization. So the benefits, you know, let's talk about the benefits. So there's potential for a long-term return on investment. I mean, this is not easy work, but I think if you, if it's done well, um, you know, I think uh, there's a long-term long-term return in terms of how we're managing risk within the organization. There's a reduction in fragmentation as as there was in the previous option. Um, we hope, if done well, that it, that there's improved patient and provider experience, um, and then we're optimizing healthcare utilization. But and capacity management, but it, uh, from a trade-off perspective, what can seem daunting, and this is where people are like, hey, yeah, whatever, Dave, because this seems like like the Cadillac, and we're just trying to get like morsels, we're trying to get breadcrumbs, you know, to kind of help pay for this. But there's a moderate upfront investment to achieve that full vision, um, and there's a fair amount of training needs, and this is a that's a big V vision, right? Yeah, um, Lee, I mean, I would say, and, and that's what I think people get scared about, but I would say is let's try to unpack this a little bit more. So let's acknowledge that you don't have a lot of resources, right? So how do we, how do we, how do we start to anchor ourselves within our own health systems to do this work? And the, and the reality is you're not going to start at the bottom often with the standardized screening and referral and the big platforms we're about to talk. You know, you're going to go hunting for those programs that have some interdisciplinary resources. Maybe it's your asthma program. Maybe it's a program for children with complex medical needs. And you're going to help them standardize the way they are praising risk and to start to build out for the social workers where they exist better clinical workflows that are aligned with improving quality within those teams. So I would say that your best bet is to focus on your proof of concept with the integrated care teams that already have existing resources um, so that you can make the uh, better uh, elaborate what the business case is going to be when you actually get down to it. There we go. Um, so anyway, so we that's exactly the strategy we've chosen. And there were a couple areas we chose to invest in. Uh, you know, from a disease management model, we we worked on creating an interdisciplinary governance group for asthma population health in our health system. Um, they're looking at, and by helping them pinpoint or hotspot very quickly the high-frequency utilizers of emergency department and inpatient services, we uh, sort of tasked them in an integrated fashion with coming up with a what they call a high-utilizer bundle. Uh, they, um, you know, they were doing standardized risk screening. They were including assessment of social determinants, but really on the back end, what they were doing is, is they identified these kids 
They started creating a plan to give the meds at the bedside, to do enhanced education, expedited referral to specialists where necessary, but then they immediately, within a, I think about a week's time, handed them to our community asthma prevention program with that included community health workers, which were going out to the home to do much more sophisticated uh, social risk screening on top of the medical, uh, the, the education. Um, this is sort of where me and Tony would fall, and I can tell you that integrated response supported by QI led to fairly demonstrable results um, on our team. And, and you can see where they implement, in this slide, which is a typical quality improvement slide, it shows the rate of our readmissions among our high-frequency utilizers, which was hovering at about 25% uh, until our bundle was implemented in this tight integration with our community teams. And you can see the readmission rate among these high utilizers dropped in half to about 12%. And so that's real data from a, from a capacity management perspective that starts to turn heads um, as opposed to the iceberg slide, right? And, uh, and that, that there's a real value in what you're trying to achieve. Now, on the next slide, we also um, looked at our sort of uh, uh, programs for children with medical complexity. Um, and one of the programs we started to develop, um, and there were several across our organization, was a partnership with a managed care plan in the area at our largest primary care site at CHOP, where we have 30,000 patients per year. This is a typical ap academic uh, sort of um, practice site, a lot of residents, um, a lot of Medicaid patients, and, and we had over 500 medically complex children enrolled in this program. The uh, managed care organization uh, provided the funding through uh, uh, care management funds to the Medicaid program for five nurse coordinators, a social worker, and two community health workers. We surrounded them with uh, quality improvement resources and in the end, um, we showed that after a much more intensive care coordination and interdisciplinary team involvement, including the assessment of social risk within these families and much more engagement with the community health response, um, we could reduce their hospitalization rates uh, overall, uh, which decreased by about uh, uh, greater than 20%. And we saw uh, similar decreases in emergency department use. And we've now replicated this approach in several different settings um, at our health system, so much so that on our final slide, um, because we made a bet with scarce resources around children in Medicaid, both the complex kids and the kids with asthma, uh, around some of our early resource deployment, um, we, we had the knowledge that they were disproportionately responsible for most of our, our bed days in our hospital. And so we demonstrated in this slide, which shows in blue at the top, the seasonal rates of hospital admissions among our primary care children in Medicaid. Um, in green are the seasonal rates of the children who are not in network to our, our primary care sites who are in the community. And what we demonstrate here is you can see that we greatly reduced hospitalizations over time uh, per thousand beneficiaries. This was across 95,000 children in our Medicaid program. And we did not deliver a dose of these interventions to most kids. It was a fraction, it was probably five, 10 percent of the kids at most, uh, but they were the right five to 10 percent. And the result was we reduced our bed days by about 6,500 bed days annually in our Medicaid program. And we have a paper coming out describing this program and the results and this comparative effectiveness trial that we, uh, um, that we um, report here. And so to me, what we've now done is taken what seems like this daunting issue of a, where do we start and we sort of said, well, let's prove it on this very precise populations and show what the impact is from the business case so that we can now start as we start to replicate to other specialty care programs. We're starting now to create needs where every program is saying, you know what we really need, Dave, is a really good resource map. And so now we're getting to that bottom tier, which is screening and referral. And Lee's going to talk a little bit about that. So we're really excited, um, sort of as Dave just described, we um, at CHOP really started with the top two tiers, but we're excited to be able to work our way down to now be thinking about the standardization of screening and referral. Um, so I'm guessing many of you um, on the webinar have encountered or discussed resource mapping, so it probably looks familiar to you. Um, but we have been working with an interdisciplinary team across CHOP um, and across our network to really think about how we can test the use of resource mapping and including social risk screening in the inpatient and ambulatory setting. And resource mapping has a few different functions. So first, it can create a centralized database that's available to all families and all providers. 
um, of community resources that is really easily searchable by things like zip code, income level, and other programmatic or personal filters. Um, but beyond that, resource mapping also has the ability to connect to social risk screeners, to integrate with the electronic health record, um, and to track data analytics for searches and referrals. So all functions that um, are fairly new within the healthcare space um, but are really exciting when we think about wanting to provide access to standard screening and referral for all of our patients across the network. So what we're trying to work toward with this project is having a system that is scalable and could be standardized. I think um, there's another element, though, Lee, too, which is like when you're starting to get capacity where you've done multiple programs, you, you're, you're then, you're, your pivot, particularly in your... Um, advocacy with your with your leadership is that we need an economy of scale. If I only had a social worker who was managing my relationships with our community agencies and building out this resource map and storing it in one place, whether you're the enhanced care management team, the asthma team, the sickle cell team, the oncology team, right, you could be pulling off the same set of resources. Uh, and so if there's a certain economy of scale that develops, and that's less fragmentation and better stewardship. Absolutely. It's a way to really leverage technology to share expertise, both within clinical teams and across clinical teams in the network. And I think beyond the, the centralized database that it provides, um, the integration with the electronic health record is a really key piece for being able to communicate within the clinical team about needs that have been screened for or referrals that have been made for that family. For example, between an inpatient and an outpatient setting. Um, and I think you know, the resource map also has developing functionality around communicating with community agencies. Um, so how can we better partner with community agencies to be able to track referrals or have some kind of bi-directional communication to know that our patients and families are connecting or to help to support them if they are not. So we are still in the early phase of this work. Um, so either in the question and answer period or following this webinar, if there are others who are also looking into resource mapping or have already had some, le some lessons learned, we would be um, happy to connect around it. So we're really in the phase of building out the resource map in partnership with our clinical team. And we'll be really focused on workflow. You know, We've talked about provider burnout um, earlier in the webinar. And technology is only as good as, you know, the teams that can use it um, or the, as the workflow itself. So um, we're really focused on implementing this in a really intentional way that's both beneficial to our providers. Um, so we are excited to be able to provide more updates in this and to really test that integrated system starting in the spring and summer. So I think to sum up, as we get to some of your questions and for the Q&A, do so. Um, but what I would say, your delivery approach, you don't need to accomplish all at once. I and mean, that's a, my take home message. It can be daunting, it can be scary. Um, but at the same time, I think mental approach and the action. Hello, are we back? We're back. <laughs> I hope. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say that, you know, the menu of the tiered uh, uh, delivery. Um, this is the part where we tell you the cat walked on the phone. Um, but uh, but the uh, but I think the sum total before we get to the Q and A here is that tiered service delivery um, to me is a menu by which you can work on to actually start to get some some uh, direction and standardization by how you're going to build out I think a fuller model to marry that to data and quality improvement within your organizations. So you can have much more substantive conversations, not just with your leaders, but with your insurance plans. Um, and uh, and I think ultimately to achieve your goal of interdisciplinary teams that are improving uh, your screening uh, for social risk and referral, um, and hopefully ultimately for greater visibility in your enterprise operating plans. And Lee, what's your thoughts uh, as, you, as we wrap this up? Yeah, I would just add, you know, the quality improvement approach is a really great way to leverage your interdisciplinary teams. So the use of interdisciplinary teams like community health workers and care coordinators and social workers, I think, is um, has been rapidly developing within healthcare. Um, and doctors, I, you know, Dave, I know doctors know everything, but in the absence of the magic wand, that until we have a magic wand, um, I think the expertise of these interdisciplinary teams can really be leveraged as you're deciding and making decisions around 
how to approach the tiered service delivery model and where you want to start and what's best for your healthcare system. So with that, I'd just like to thank the many partners that have allowed us to break ground here um, at CHOP um, and, uh, and recognize that this is not uh, there are a lot of people you need to kind of, you need to build an army, if you will, and there's a lot of great people that can come together um, within your own organizations to help you. Um, so I think it's time for some fun Q&A. What do you think, Lee? If those of you guys have to go, we understand. Um, but uh, maybe we can get dive into some uh, very specific uh, questions that people are interested in. Absolutely. I think we can just take a minute or two since I know we're almost at time. Um, and I believe for those of you on the webinar and those of you who can stay, you can use the chat function to submit any questions um, that you have for us. And you're obviously welcome to reach out to either Dave or I after the webinar. Um, so Dave, maybe we can start with um, this question around um, being in a small hospital. So we got this question by email. Is how can you incorporate or push for these ideas as a hospitalist in a small hospital, especially where funding can come, especially where funding can come from, and how you can move beyond the borders of the hospital. Well, I mean, ultimately, you got to find those partners. I think within your health system, and I, I recognize that it's very hard. You may not have as as well integrated uh, electronic health record data. A lot of your smaller hospitals are often out in communities that are a little smaller. I think if you can endear yourself to the social work resources or case management resources and form a little bit of an interdisciplinary team yourself, um, you can start to build out that resource map. You can get a local uh, foundation or um, uh, a local funder to help start to do that, um, you know, with you within your organization. And I think, you know, if you build out that resource map, I think that the, I think you can take the same approach. I mean, are you are you do you have a program for the kids with medical complexity who are using your hospital frequently? Are there specific populations that you might be able to to just say we're not going to do this for the thousand kids, we're going to do this for a couple hundred kids that we know are are frequent users of our services and really try to marry a program. Uh, for those children. And so I still think, um, you know, finding that population, finding interdisciplinary partners is the sort of way I would attack that problem, even if I were in a small institution. What do you think? Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, assuming that small hospital may mean also a smaller community, I think um, leveraging the community expertise and the community agencies within that community, sometimes forming a partnership with the one or two really major community agencies um, you know, in the community can be a great way to start because you can start to form um, referral pipelines or even some co-located services um, just based on the existing resources outside the hospital's walls. What else we got? So let's see. Um, how about this one? Healthcare professionals are increasingly being pulled in many directions, particularly in pediatrics. Um, and they're taking on more and more. So how do you get buy-in from multiple members of an integrated team to address social determinants? I think this is a great question. Well, I think I think I recognize that I can't, you know, as a physician, I, you know, I couldn't build this program without other folks. This is not a physician response. I think people have to hang up their, their own sort of, um, I, I think if we do this burdening the physician or the nurse practitioner who's on the front line, it's going to fail. Um, uh, under its weight. To me, you have to start building uh, uh, the work across team members, and I would think fairly broadly. Sometimes it's nurses, sometimes it's social workers, sometimes it's your your patient service representative who's really interested in this. And, you know, a lot of these folks live in the same communities. And so uh, this is really about teamwork and starting to build a team and thinking about how do we distribute a workflow if we want to make progress here. And I think this comes back to the quality improvement approach that we've mentioned, is I think it's really important to start small, is a lot of this work is building in new workflows to into teams that are already overwhelmed by um, the existing medical services that they're providing. So um, starting really small and making sure that it's being implemented in a way that isn't adding extra work to people's plates, but also appealing to the changes that the interdisciplinary team wants to make. So we've talked about provider burnout. Um, we've talked about how often these issues are probably coming up for multiple people on the team. So appealing to um, you know those changes and, and being clear about um, the gap that these services can fill. 
I think we're having some technical uh, problems with the chat function on the, uh, so people, I'm going to ask you to send, if you have questions, send them to policylab.webinar at gmail.com. Webinars, plural. Policylab.webinars at gmail.com. We'll accept your questions through the back door. We're thinking on the fly here, right? Mm -hmm. Never love your plan. Right. Um, so policylab.webnars at gmail.com. What else? I think we have a couple other questions. Yeah. We... So in, in the meantime, feel free to send your questions there. Um, but I, I think this is a really great question too, Dave. So what if you can only accomplish plan B? Is it worth it? So you can only really have the capacity or the funding to implement social risk screening. I don't know. I think knowing the condition on the ground for our providers, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm skeptical of that. I just, uh, you know, I think if that's all, if that's the only place you're going to be able to go, I think you're going to get a lot of resistance from your provider teams. Yeah, I think we also have to think about this from the perspective of the patient and family. Is that whenever we screen, we just have to be really clear about and, and transparent with the family about why we are screening. So, you know, I think it's a common response to this um, when we talk just about screening to say that the family's experiencing the need no matter what, whether we're asking about it or not, and that sometimes we need some of that baseline data if we don't even know the prevalence of the need in the community. I think there's a lot of validity to that, but I think if you are screening and you don't have the capacity to be able to support the family in response to a positive need, um, and maybe it's more in a research context, then um, you have to be really transparent with patients and families about that before you screen them and um, sort of let them make that decision when they answer your questions or disclose a social need to you. So Dave, I, I know we're at time. And for those of you who um, may have emailed questions to the Gmail account, we are happy to follow up um, or you are happy or you're welcome to email us Directly. following this webinar. And we just remember policylab.webinars at gmail.com. Or Lee, were you going to give out your cell phone number? I think was the other plan, right? To everyone on the phone. Maybe, maybe not quite. All right. Um, well, anyway, uh, we thank you guys for coming today. Come visit visit us at the website. Uh, reach out to Lee and myself. Um, be happy to ask, answer some questions offline. And uh, did you have something else you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that we'll be posting a recording of the webinar to our website. So we encourage you to share um, and or to go back and listen if you are compelled to listen a second time. Um, and we just really appreciate everyone who was able to join today. Thanks so much. Thank you.